Good afternoon, everyone, or indeed good evening, as the case may be. Um, lovely to uh, to be back uh, after after our Easter break for the uh, first seminar of the final stretch of the 2020-2021 uh, new work on the Roman Republic uh, seminars. Um, it's a great pleasure uh, today to have the chance to uh, welcome back. He's a regular at our seminars, uh, Dr. Roman uh, Frolov. Uh, who uh, teaches at uh, Yaroslav State University in, uh, in Russia. Um, he specializes in uh, the uh, political and legal history of the, of the Roman Republic. His uh, doctorate is a, is a study uh, defended in 2013 of Roman Contiones in the constitution and political life of the Republic, uh, defended at uh, Lomonosov Moscow State university. Um, and uh, he has over the last few years published a, an impressive set of, uh, of papers on, on a number of aspects of uh, Roman Republic and especially late Republican history um, at a very original intersection between political history and uh, uh, constitutional sort of legal, legal history. Uh, a major focus of interest of his is indeed the magistrate, or mag the the magistracy and magistracies in the plural uh, in uh, uh, Republican Rome and, and indeed the uh, complexities of magisterial status vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the status of privatus in uh, the Roman Republic and in Roman Republican uh, culture. Um, he held a uh, Humboldt fellowship at the uh, University of uh, uh, Bielefeld um, in 2018, 2019. Um, and in that connection, he also uh, worked uh, on uh, the, the, the wider issues of leadership and, and authority in, in Roman uh, politics and in Roman political culture. Um, those who are familiar with Roman's work are well aware of the uh, great ingenuity that he deploys in the, in the detailed study of uh, complex, if sometimes also hotly debated, uh, pieces of evidence, uh, especially literary, and uh, uh, the paper that he's presenting this evening indeed does take us squarely into the domain of, of uh, well, the detailed investigation of literary uh, sources, indeed of a, of a poetic text of Lucan's poem, but also takes us to the uh, intersection between uh, political and legal history that is uh, so central to, to his interests. Uh, his title has a rather beautiful uh, Simeon ring to it, uh, Lucan and Republican proconsuls. Um, I'm told that there's a, a PowerPoint. Uh, Roman, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, Federico. Thank you so much, Mattia, for uh, this opportunity to present uh, uh, my work today at this wonderful seminar, which has to has already proved to be. I mean, that's the second session already. But anyway. Um, uh, offering a wide, very wide range of themes, but at the same time concentrating on our uh, favorite uh, period in the Roman history. So thank you so much. Thank you uh, everybody for uh, being here today. So I will now start um, presentation. Um, so please let me know if you can see it. Yes, we can. Or at least I can. Good. Yes. Good. Um, well, um, so here's the title. Um, uh, and although the title uh, of this talk begins with Lucan, uh, I will not be talking as much about uh, Lucan as about the late Republican pro magistracy. And the thing is that I will provide a, ra a rather straightforward uh, reading analysis of Lucan from uh, a viewpoint of a scholar who finds in this literary creation some surprisingly detailed uh, and often essentially accurate, but also sometimes, of course, challenging reflections on uh, late Republican pro magistracy. Uh, I will argue that the poet provides important clues as to whether at all and in which way the Romans thought about the fact that uh, both, both major actors in the Civil War uh, Caesar and Pompeius started it in 49 BCE in their capacity as non-magistrates, 
endow it with Imperium. And it would, and that it was in this capacity that Caesar and Pompeius not only dominated the military sphere, but also interfered openly and directly in the political decision making in the city of Rome, something normally not expected from Republican from magistrates. Uh, modern commentators have uh, interpreted in many different ways uh, the use by Lucan of the term privatus to characterize Caesar and Pompeius, providing various ad hoc explanations for each particular application of this label. Um, however, as far as I can say, scholars mostly have failed to ponder the possibility that Lucan's use of the term privatus may uh, correspond perfectly, or even I think corresponds perfectly to a late Republican normative definition of pre-magistrates, pre-councils as privati vis-a-vis -vis, uh, magistrates. Of course, this idea in itself that all pre-magistrates were considered privati vis-a-vis -vis magistrates is in itself uh, a matter of debate. Uh, but I think if we assume this idea, then we can see some um, surprising details uh, offering more glimpses into pre magistracy in Lucan if we accept this. So I will go back to this. But then um, the term privatus is not used in a neutral way, but it highlights additionally the contradiction between the uh, this per council's formal ascription to the category of privati and their unusual proactive role, not just militiae, but also domi in the sphere uh, domi. Thus, I will argue that Lucan is perhaps a little bit more historically correct, and at least more sophisticated at this point than has been usually assumed. And as I hope to demonstrate, uh, Lucan reflects quite precisely, uh, sensitively, uh, the Republican concerns about pre magistrates' potential to intervene in the city politics of Rome. At the same time, there are still some important distortions on, on Lucan's part, in Lucan's representation of the holders of pre councillor power, uh, but the distortions which uh, the poet is able to introduce in his text precisely because uh, he was fully aware of the Republican tendency uh, to see pre-magistrates, pre-councils as privati when they are explicitly or implicitly compared to magistratus. As some of you, uh, as I'm sure all of you may be thinking at this point, to explain local, looking in this way becomes possible only on the, on the couple of assumptions. And one assumption is that his vocabulary to designate pre-magistrates as non-magisterial public officials was essentially limited to a choice between the term privatus and the label magistratus as parts of the dichotomy which allegedly dominated the Republican self descriptions. And here it depends on the works by Ali Swinterling. And in addition to this, the understanding which I suggest works only if we challenge the widespread scholarly assumption, uh, widespread scholarly idea that legitimate pre magistrates could not be technically termed privati. Um, this issue in itself, again, should become a subject of another extensive talk, but a, a shorter digression uh, on this is still necessary for my argument in the present study. Um, so, pro magistrates as privati. Uh, while all scholars seem to accept that pro magistrates were understood by ancient sources as non magistratus, it is much less clear whether we can say that our sources, especially literary sources, considered pre magistrates as privati, and when they did that. At least at one point, uh, Theodor Mommsen seems to suggest that all pre magistrates, at least this is my impression from this passage from his work, uh, that all pre magistrates, including those by prorogation, were considered essentially as privati. Um, anyway, this view had, has found some support. Uh, more recently, for example, Fred Rogula uh, has observed that since the pre magistrate held no official status or civilian authority in Rome, he was technically a private citizen invested with uh, uh, the full might of Imperium. Uh, just as other modern scholars, Drogula uses the term privati cum imperio, which is not used in our ancient sources, to indicate uh, only those men who were private citizens when they received Imperium and Provincia. But Drogula nevertheless emphasizes, as you can see, that all, all pre magistrates were technically privati cum imperio because they uh, no longer held a public magistrate in Rome. And I think that this assessment is correct. However, 
quite a few scholars, in fact, has argued for the opposite. Uh, and still more, uh, many more accepted as self-evident that legitimate per magistrate per magistrates could not be called privati. Uh, consider, for instance, um, a brief note by Johann Bleiken as per magistrat hörten sie benauft privatus zu sein. As a per magistrate, they would have just stopped uh, being privatus. Quite a few clauses from the Republican laws attested epigraphically certainly confirmed that uh, per magistrates were strictly distinguished from magistrates, but were they conceived of as privati? Uh, his excellent habilitation shift, which is on uh, Imperia Extra Ordinaria, uh, Wolfgang Blöset has provided uh, by uh, so far the most elaborated argument against the idea that per magistrates were included in the category of privati. Um, Blöset understands the enumeration of the different types of the holders of political power in the epigraphically attested laws as the evidence for the assertion that those privati who received imperium, even if they were, had been privati before that, but when they received imperium, they were not considered privati anymore. Instead, they were included in a kind of a third category between the two poles, between magistratus and privatus. They were neither this nor that. Uh, instead, they were occupying a quasi-magisterial position. But I think while pre-magistrates undoubtedly found themselves in between these two categories politically, an obvious objection, uh, at least a possible objection uh, to Bloz's idea is that in respective passages of the laws, as you can see, um, the laws are not interested in the private citizens who did not have any public power. And therefore the laws do not provide an explicit information on the relation of pre-magistrates to so to speak, privati sine imperio. Or maybe maybe they do. Um, the two chapters from the Lex Coloniae Genitiva, which is characterized by Michael Crawford as a pre-Augustine document drawing on Republican material from many different periods, um, may, uh, may uh, perhaps allow us to say more. In these passages, the manner is regulated in which patrons might be acquired by cities. Um, one of the requirements for a would-be patron of senatorial status is that at the time when his candidacy is being discussed, he must be in Italy as a private individual without imperium. In Italian, sin imperio, privato seri. Um, Wolfgang Blöser argues that it is preferable to take sin imperio and privatus uh, in these lines as in fact not directly, not logically connected with each other and to understand privatus here as a synonym for sine magistrato, that is sine imperio, sine magistrato, edit. Um, in this case, the clause may be taken to exclude first those who were the per magistrates and the magistrates cum imperio, because both had imperium. And secondly, those per magistrates who did not have imperium, sine imperio, uh, sine, um, uh, sine imperio, which seems to be quite uh, logical. But the question is, is such a substitution of privatus by sine magistratu a correct procedure? And I think that in Blöser's own terms, it is rather not. The problem uh, with this argument consists precisely in the fact that Blöser accepts as self-evident, at least he's trying to argue, the point that uh, per magistrates, that is, qui imperium haben, um, were considered neither privati nor magistratus, as I said already. Uh, but if this is accepted, then um, uh, it, in this case, sine magistrata taken separately, completely detached from sine imperio, and understood as a second self-sufficient element in this enumeration, must refer both to privati and per magistrates qui imperio habent. But this is then in direct contradiction with the exclusion of per magistrates already indicated by sine magistrato, sine imperio. Therefore, um, please do correct me if I'm wrong, but as far as I can say now, uh, it seems to me that uh, the only option to understand these lines is to read sine imperio privatus as a unity. There exists some privati sine imperio. If so, then the term privatus, if it is used without further clarifications, was not automatically assumed to lack imperium. 
This in turn presupposes the existence of those Priwali who were endowed with Imperium, and we cannot define them in any other way as per magistrates who therefore were included formally in the category of Privati. Of course, the question is, um, we have just probably just one example of this kind of usage. Um, and the chapters 130, 131 of the Lex Colonia Cinitiva will provide this unique confirmation to the idea that per magistrates formally defined as Privati and all of them, probably because these chapters are themselves singular. Here, the legislator must have found a way to refer to those who were neither magistrates nor per magistrates. But he does not call such actors simply privati. He finds it important to indicate that, uh, more specifically, that he means those privati who do not uh, hold imperium. Um, but this perhaps seem, may seem a little bit too technical and um, not having much to do with the political reality. So the question is, uh, what our lit literary sources say about this. And yes, they too sometimes uh, label pro magistrates as privati. Um, scholars, um, including Wolfgang Blösel, often argues this instance is away because in all of them, imperium holders are allegedly characterized as illegal, as usurpers, that is, as not really pro magistrates. And it is only for this reason that they could be called privati. I think that idea that pro magistrates must be legal must be not really considered, uh, must not really be considered as pro magistrates to allow to call them privati is certainly wrong. And um, I do think, however, that some additional reasons uh, must exist that compelled our ancient authors to remind of the fact that pro magistrates were privati, but these were not the reasons which compelled them to change. Uh, the status of these actors and, and, and to call them privati. <laughs> and of course, there are many uh, points pro and contra both of these views. And because this is not the paper concentrated on this question, I will provide just one example, but there are more, of course, in both directions. But consider this passage uh, from Levy, uh, where Levy unequivocally calls the preconsuls uh, privati. Like uh, Wolfgang Blösel, um, Frederick Beva thinks that the Jure holders of full Imperium of Spikyonku were certainly not privati. And Beva dismisses this passage of Livy precisely on the grounds that the ancient sources sometimes define all non magisterial holders of Imperium as privati, but only when it comes to certain politicized situations. But I think that this argument misses the point because in this passage, the political criticism is directed against the Senate, not against the pre magistrates themselves. The problem was that the Senate retained important commands in the hands of proconsuls for far too long. Not that these uh, particular proconsuls were somehow illegitimate or not to speak, not to say illegal or um, uh, uh, non-existent, so to speak, in, in, in legal terms. Um, consider, for instance, this lines to this decree of the Senate, the Council Levitus objected. He objected to the decree of the Senate. If it were the Senate's pleasure that there should be armies in those lands, councils rather than private citizens should command them. But the problem was not that these particular councils were somehow uh, usurping their position. It seems to me that the legal technical usage still included for magistrates in the category of privati, but political language was, of course, much more flexible. And admittedly, uh, in the everyday usage of Cicero's time, the word privati without further clarifications was normally taken to refer to those who did not have imperium. We have, for instance, the proconsul uh, Cicero who uh, compares himself with, um, uh, with um, uh, privati, so he distinguishes himself from privati. Or we also have uh, this language reflected for instance, in the descriptions of uh, Caesar's return from uh, to Rome um, after his proconsulate, the idea that he could return to Rome. Um, and in the process, what they talk about is uh, they envisage they, this process as his return to the status of uh, privatus. Um, so I'm just wondering whether the connection is still here. Okay, yeah, seems so. Yeah, yeah, all's good. Um, so, um, 
But on the other hand, as you can see uh, in the second uh, passage here, Valesius Cato can call Caesar uh, an incumbent proconsul, by the way, in this time, Emir Kivis, with whom the Republic should not conduct any negotiations. Um, and of course, we may know that Cato was something was trying to criticize Caesar. Perhaps this is for this. Uh, it is for this reason that he called him Kibis. But as far as I know, uh, nobody questioned the legality of Caesar's imperium until he crossed uh, the city boundary. But he did not. So the problem was with his provinces, uh, and the people acting against him in, in Rome were talking about his provinciae. But this in itself could not affect the pre-magisterial status of Caesar until he crossed the city boundary or until his imperium was abrogated, which never happened, abrogated. Um, so Cato is still pro perfectly able to label uh, the pre-magistrate Echivis vis-a-vis Respublica. He does this to uh, underline that, that he's not particularly happy about Caesar, but this does not mean that he calls him Chivis just because he wants to reduce somehow his legal, Caesar's legal status. On the other hand, the privatus status of a proconsul remains virtually irrelevant as long as his acting, normal acting in the provinces is described. And this is what is usually described in our sources. And this is what is usually studied by those who are interested in the pre-magistracy, what pre-magistrates did in their provinces. But what happened if they did not contain themselves in the provinces? So that's the question. Um, and we can see here, certainly, additional circumstances that compelled um, um, Valerius Cater to a call, to remind their audiences that Caesar was, in fact, in privatus. And we will see shortly the same thing in Lucan's usage as well. The reason, I think, for this strange use of the term privatus to mark some problem with those who formerly were, had already been privati anyway, is apparently caused uh, this duplication of the term uh, in its function, caused by the absence of any alternative to the dichotomy privatus magistratus. How else would you call a magistrate in poetry, for instance? Um, and this led, I think, to the application um, uh, of this term privatus in two different uh, in, in, in different ways. Um, so on the one hand, the legal status, on the other hand, this is the reference to, this is the reaction to one's attempt to use public power in the wrong sphere of action. By the wrong sphere of action, I mean a contradiction in terms, namely per magistrate's direct and personal involvement in the sphere, domin the civil affair, uh, affairs at Rome. Per magistrates lost their power upon crossing the city boundary. They could not convene the Senate even outside uh, the city. Uh, however, late Republican proconsuls did increasingly intervene in the political processes of Rome, and this did become for the Romans a matter of great concern. As a result, the subtle differences between pre-magistrates and magistrates suddenly became relevant again, or maybe they bec became relevant for the first time. Um, against this background, for, consider, for instance, the occasional direct labeling uh, of pre-magistrates as mag magistrates. In fact, our literary sources very often call uh, pro praetors simply praetores. Uh, but imagine if this pro praetor would come to Rome, would be active in Rome, would try, I don't know, across the city boundary, uh, or if he tried to convene the Senate even outside the city boundary. I do not think that he would be called a praetor in this way. Uh, I do not think that that he, the, the definition of this actor would remain the same. He was not supposed to have any powers in such cases. Uh, so I think that the old idea that magistrates uh, were distinct from magistrates because they did not have power in this in the city still uh, still is compelling. Um, and if so, then as far as the sphere of domestic politics is concerned, not only was a pre-magistrate not a magistratus in the Roman sense, but he even was not a public official uh, in the modern sense. Paradoxically, the Roman term privatus, for all the confusion it creates, reflects this aspect of late Republican political reality quite well. That is the aspect um, by which I mean the attempts of pre magistrate to act somewhere near to the political center of the Republic. Now, finally, to Lucan. This is the second part of my argument in this uh, talk. Uh, and Lucan, in fact, allows us to 
better appreciate the issues I just outlined, even though I use this poetic creation perhaps a little bit <laughs> too straightforward way. But anyway, I will start perhaps, perhaps with, with the most notable example uh, of Lucan's use of the term privatus to indicate an incumbent from magistrate. In 49, after Pompeius had been able to escape Caesar and leave Italy, Caesar returned to Rome. While remaining a proconsul, he could not cross the city boundary. And as far as I can tell, modern scholarship has not questioned the conclusion that the Senate meeting on the 1st of April and in the following days, and the contio, in both of which the proconsul Caesar participated, took place at Urban, near the city, rather than in Urbe, in the city. Cassius Dio tells us explicitly uh, that the Senate convened outside the Pomerium exatu Pomerio, and that it was officially summoned by the tribunes Antonius and Cassius Longinus. The contio which followed too was duly convened outside the Pomerium, according to Dio. But in Lucan, uh, the situation is very different. Uh, the Senate assembles on the Palatine, that is inside the city boundary. Uh, the tribunes play no part, and the senators are summoned by Caesar himself. Lucan not only makes Caesar the convener, but he also additionally emphasizes, employing quasi juridical uh, terminology even, that the proconsul uh, did not have the right to convene the Senate. No look again, the Iuris Senatus. We can move the events uh, from the suburbs onto the Palatine into the city, committing an obvious anachronism in the process uh, because he makes Caesar to convene the Senate uh, uh, in the Temple of Apollo, which is on the Palatine, which did not exist at the time. Under the Republic, there existed only a Temple of Apollo, which was situated on the Capus Martius, that is it the area inside the city. And this uh, distortion has, of course, been multiple times mentioned in the scholarship. But, the, but my point is that the, the, the distortion itself, the way uh, how this distortion is constructed, plays precisely on the differences between magistrates and from magistrates. Because if you have um, perhaps indeed uh, the Senate convening uh, at the Temple of Apollo, but the Republican one, then this is the perfect. And then, then you have the Imperial Temple, which is outside the city boundary. This is the perfect material for Lucan to play with. And he did does precisely that. Um, because outside the city, and we know this from other sources, Caesar stayed there, um, but then in Lucan, he did not. In this context, and it, it is in this context, that Lucan employs the term privatus, and he's the line. Caesar was all, and the Senate meant to register the utterance of a private man, omnia kaiser erat. Now, um, I found the most helpful in um, addressing these issues um, uh, a couple of works by Elaine Fentham, of course, as a specialist, uh, particularly in how Lucan represents the uh, Senate. Um, even though I do not agree with some particular points, but anyway, this is, uh, I think, the most helpful and illuminating work uh, in this case. Uh, but um, Elaine Fentham, uh, comments on this line uh, in lines in book uh, three in this way. She considers as an, uh, this as an example of the ideological exploitation of privatus by Lucan. She argued that Lucan fairly reproaches Caesar with addressing the Senate as a privatus because, and here is the explanation, uh, Caesar's preconcellary command in Gaul was constitutionally terminated as soon as a successor was named, or he himself entered Italy. Uh, and he had not yet been elected consul. This view rightly accounts for uh, Caesar's lack of magisterial status and his transgressing the limits of, of his pramagisterial task. However, Lucan does not, uh, in fact, criticize Caesar's speaking to the Senate as a privatus, which in itself was, of course, perfectly in accordance with the tradition. Um, Instead, for Lucan, the problem consisted, consisted, the problem which Lucan, of course, himself creates, but nevertheless, it consisted in Caesar's convocation of the Senate without formal powers to do so. Is Caesar perhaps called a privatus only because for Lucan he crossed the city boundary? I do not think so. Look at no way underlines the fact that Caesar changed his status. Rather, he remains a privatus the whole time, all, all the time, regardless of whether or not he entered from. There is no change here. Uh, but the commentaries which existed, um, they usually, 
mostly do not contemplate on, on these issues. Very, uh, in a very strange way, for example, uh, in the commentary by Jan Radicke, of course, he points out that Caesar is called Privatus because uh, zum Zeitpunkt seines Einmarsches in Rome, keine magistratische Gewalt mehr besaß. He did not have, the Caesar did not have uh, magisterial power anymore uh, on his return to Rome. But there is no question of magisterial status at all. Caesar had been magistrate many years ago. Uh, he did not claim to be a magistrate. He was a proconsul. Um, but somehow this status, the mentioning of this, uh, is, is completely absent from this commentary. Unlike uh, Radike, Vincent Huning emphasized the significance of the word privatus itself in this passage. But then he maintains that the adjective is used for persons who do not hold any public office. Precisely the assumption, I have questions just, have questioned just moments ago. Um, Huning argues that Lucan regularly exploits this idea that uh, the idea of privatus is the one who does not hold any public power for pathetic effects, especially in relation to Caesar. And this is actually quite widespread in the scholarship. Consider, for instance, um, uh, Monica Matthews words that uh, privatus is a word regularly used uh, to, in connection with Caesar, again, for its ironic uh, or pathetic potential. Just as Huning Matthews maintains um, that Caesar being a military commander could not technically be regarded as a privatus. And it is of course for these reasons that scholars um, uh, only account for the possibility of an ironic or pathetic usage of the term, that Lucan is not using this term technically correctly, which I think is not the case. Um, moreover, when Huning, for example, provides further references to this kind of usage in Lucan, he mentions not only the passages where Lucan describes Caesar uh, as privatus before he assumed magistracy in Lucan's narrative, but Huning also refers, for instance, to Book Five, where in Lucan's narrative, Caesar is already a magistrate. But these are two completely different situations. And of course, we, we may say that it is not important for Lucan, but I think that if we assume for a moment, just consider for a moment that Lucan might be able to distinguish these two situations. And then by using privatus in, uh, refer with reference to the incumbent magistrate, he would suggest perhaps losing magistracy, that he means losing, losing magistracy, and in relation to per magistrate, when he's using this term in relation to uh, per magistrate, he is perhaps applying something completely different. Um, consider the lines from book four. Uh, look on, um, well, um, then in a moment, the frenzy of civil war will collapse. And just a question if, if you can see the, actually the whole line here. And, and no windows, right? Okay, good. Um, so then in a moment, the frenzy, um, um, well, where is it here? We go, uh, the frenzy of civil war will collapse and Caesar in private station as a privatus will be friends with his daughter's husband. Uh, Paolo Asa comments, uh, Lucan in fact has the Pompeians refer to Caesar as a privatus, a private citizen here in these lines, because his command for 49 was as proconsul of Gaul in Illyricum. So his presence as a legion commander in Spain was illegal, uh, a detail understandably unmentioned by Caesar in his Palenquible. But again, although acting outside of one's proconsul or provincia could indeed perhaps be stamped as illegal, a proconsul without a provincia uh, could not use his, could not use, make use of his imperium in, in any province, not just in Spain as also things. But even the loss of all the provinces could not make Caesar to lose his pre-magisterial status. This is, by the way, uh, something which uh, on, on which uh, I think Klaus Martin Jade has commented, um, precisely in relation to Caesar in his book on, on January 49. Therefore, if Caesar is called the privatus here, then um, not because of the fact in which specific province he was acting, but because he in principle was a privatus. At least this particular explanation doesn't work, I think. Uh, even if looking indeed, as we can see here in these lines, implies some have some possibility of a future change, which should first occur, and then only then could it compel the privatus Caesar to come to terms with Pompeius, then even in this case, 
the change which is envisaged could only amount to Caesar's loss of the support of his army. But one's loss of the support of one's army could not have any bearing on one's formal position as imperial holder. Well, um, of course, again, the question is whether Lucan considered this um, technicalities important at all. Um, but, well, I think this at least is possible. But the scholarly commentaries just mentioned build on the assumption that legally appointed and lawfully acting for magistrates could not be considered privati. And consequently, the problem is that modern commentators are forced to search for the additional, some additional explanations, some additional reasons why Lucan degraded the preconsul Caesar to a privatus. Perhaps, perhaps um, while what one might, may find such an ad hoc explanation, either constitutional or ideological or literary, for why the poet reproaches Caesar this way, it remains incomprehensible why he also considered the proconsul Pompeius as a privatus. Considering that Pompeius was not acting explicitly legally as Caesar, and he is not at least the object of Lucan's criticism in the way Caesar is. Uh, the lines from Book Two characterize where Lucan's Brutus characterizes Pompeius's leadership uh, as that of a privatus, duke privato. And Alain Phantom points out, commenting on this passage, that Pompey was not, in fact, privatus in 49, but still held proconsular imperium in the two Spains, which he administered through deputies. But in Italy, he was without authority. Here, here goes the explanation. What, what is wrong here? Uh, he was without authority except such as was confirmed on him by the emergency decree of the 7th of January. It suits Lucan's argument. Um, uh, to ignore this special authorization, although it was recognized by senatorial conservatives like Cato. So indeed, if one assumes that holding imperium as a proconsul already meant that Pompeius could not be called a privatus, um, how to explain Lucan's word usage? It would have been easier uh, had Lucan put these words in Caesar's mouth, but he did not. As a result, Phantom had to look for some kind of explanation outside of the assumption that the label privatus was simply an outright rejection of the legitimacy of one's enemy in a civil war. She saw the reason uh, for Brutus's assessment in the fact that Pompeius, although empowered by the Senatus Consultum Multimum, did not have the authority in Italy. She then immediately and correctly pointed to a problem with this explanation. Even senatorial conservatives, including Cato, did recognize and were happy about the legitimacy of Pompeius's empowerment, at least to a certain extent. Uh, now, historically, uh, Pompeius retained imperium outside of Rome and Italy. He only lacked uh, a provincia to make use of it there. He received such a task from the Senate, and everything were now, was now in place. So even if we assume for the sake of argument that only those per magistrates could be considered as privati who were acting without authorization in a particular area, that was not the case with Pompeius here. Now, yet again, the question is, did Lucan appreciate this? And I think he did. Um, as Phantom, by the way, herself pointed out, according to Lucan's Cato, Pompey's forces assigned to him by the Senate are publica signa. They are authorized by the state. Um, in this connection, uh, Giovanni Viancino, uh, again, reiterating the view that in Lucan, the term privatus refers to those who did not have any uh, official power altogether, or at least were not authorized by the Senate. He then argues that up to a certain point, not only Caesar, but also Pompeius were acting illegally. Uh, but in fact, we see that um, Lucan underlines already in book two that uh, at least Pompeius did enjoy the authorization from the Senate. So why then Lucan still calls Pompeius a privatus? My explanation is twofold. First, as I agreed already, privatus is illegally correct definition of any per magistrate vis-a-vis -vis magistratus. So we do need a comparison, or at least an, an implicit comparison with, with magistrates uh, so that we can uh, find the references to these per magistrates as privatia rather than just some kind of imperial holders. But uh, also in addition to this, secondly, and this is again what uh, the thing about which Phantom rightly reminded us, Lucan does not uh, approve the necessity to place uh, the proconsul Pompeius above the Senate 
and the Council Subyuga Pompeii. By employing the term privatus, therefore, we can underline the inability of incumbent magistratus to deal with Caesar without the assistance, the assistance of the part of another too powerful proconsul. Um, although primagistrates can be distinguished from common privati, of course, because only the first had imperium, our mention so authors also employ privatus to indicate specifically those primagistrates who transgressed the limits of their powers, so perhaps who did receive too much power, uh, for example, by way of intervening in the city politics or by substituting the magistrates in their uh, main roles. Um, in look, and this is clearly visible in uh, his description of the Senate meeting in which Omnia Kaiser added, Caesar was all. Uh, the paradox is that all that Lucan needed to criticize such an intervention uh, in the city politics was just to remind uh, of the formal status of preconsulus privati. Uh, and a privatus, any privatus with or without imperium, was not supposed to have control over the agenda setting, especially in the Senate, in the way uh, presiding magistrates exercise this control. Uh, again, I return to the question, is it legitimate for us seriously to consider uh, if possible at all that Lucan indeed implied the Republican technical differences between magistrates and pre-magistrates? And I think the answer should be positive. Um, in book nine, uh, Tarcon di Motus, oh sorry, this is this one, uh, provides a constitutional objection uh, to which Cato has no answer. If you, Cato, are always a faithful fellow, follower of uh, national law and your country's cause, then let us seek the standards which the Roman council bears. This time, publica jura is with Caesar, because he is consul now, not a proconsul anymore who had been acting earlier on his own initiative as a convener of the Senate. Similarly, in book five, Lucan's concern is precisely the termination of the consul's office at the end of 49, and the need to substitute magistrates with the privatus Pompeius who should receive at least some additional authorization from the Senate. The problem with uh, was the problem was that Lucan Caesar, and historical Caesar as well, tried to act as a magistratus even before he be became such officially. In this connection, one detail in uh, Lucan's depiction in Book Five um, of Caesar's return to Rome after the victory. Um, at Massilia, his appointment as dictarian consul is of particular interest. Caesar desired to, comb to combine the Roman axis with his blades and add the fasces to his eagles, snatching at the empty name of uh, legal office. Commanding on this, uh, Phantom observed that Caesar was not dictator when he assumed consulship on the 1st of January 48th. Therefore, when Lucan says that Caesar added the consul's fasces to his legionary standards, the poet uh, hardly implies simultaneous exercise of the two offices. Instead, uh, he can mean Caesar's continuation of warfare during his consulship. I think that Phantom was undoubtedly correct in uh, seeing here the reference to some improper combination of military and civil power. But I believe that uh, since, as we have seen, Lucan does appreciate the constitutional weakness of Caesar's position as a proconsul who was not ab able to convene the Senate, for example, and this is the reason for which Lucan made him to convene the Senate. It is therefore no wonder that in, on Lucan's view, dictatorship and consulship finally allowed Caesars legitimately to combine both military strength, which he had already had as a proconsul, with the legitimate civil authority of consul and or dictator in the city of Rome. Uh, in Book 9, um, we have the lines uh, characterization by Lucan Cato of Pompeius as a proconsul. The famous lines, uh, he alone when the people were willing to be his slaves remain in private station. He ruled the Senate, but it was the Senate of Kings. Uh, Claudia Vick in her commentary uh, points out that although privatus indicates someone without office, so she again reiterates this view, but then she says admittedly, in this case, uh, also normalerweise Privatmann steht im Gegensatz zu Publikus, Amtsinhaber, Magistrat, bisweilen auch Kommandant. Im vorliegenden Zusammenhang kann aber mit Privates nicht das unpolitische Individuum gemein sein. 
So in this particular case, she argues, the term cannot refer to a non-political private individual. She then rightly observes that our ancient authors, in particular Cicero, may use privatus for those who are politically active but do not have the public power, or rather I would say precisely a magistracy, for example, Scipio Nasica. Uh, referring to the imperial dichotomy privatus princeps, in which the category privatus now included magistratus as well, in a paradoxical way, so wonderful described by Alois Winterling, Vic concludes that in our passage from Book 9, the term privatus characterizes Pompeius as the, uh, well, Amtsenhaber, um, some kind of public official who accumulates unprecedented power. That is, we have privatus indicating a uh, public official. And this, I think, is correct. Um, uh, Vic says that Pompeius follows Republican convictions and insofar as he lays down his powers as prescribed, avoids uh, dictatorship tyranny as uh, Marius and Ursula and so on. This is generally convincing. However, if privatus can be about not holding office, but also at the same time remaining politically active and even dominant in the Republic. And if furthermore, this refers precisely to Pompeius, then we may ask perhaps the question uh, about the way in which Pompeius's career complied to this description. In fact, for many years preceding the civil war, Pompeius did not remain a private citizen in the modern sense, that is without any public power. Rather, he was either active uh, as a pre-magistrate in the provinces, sometimes very rarely as a magistrate, but usually as a pre-magistrate in the provinces, far from Rome, or he dwelled at Urbem, near the city, as an imperium holder. Lucan could well have subsumed, um, I think must have subsumed, uh, this situation as well under the label Pompeius when he describes uh, his political career. Uh, he's, a, uh, uh, he's receiving the new position of director uh, Sinatus. Um, now, during his stay near Rome, as a proconsul, Pompeius, historically, was not, for instance, just waiting for a triumph, uh, and for this reason, retaining his imperium, as some other pre-magistrates did. Rather, Pompeius attempted to control and direct the Senate and the Republic, unofficially, indeed, as a rector senatus, despite the limitations of his formal position. If so, then perhaps Lucan's solus privatus may imply not only or either to suggest even not so much that Pompeius was the only one who was prepared to lay down his powers and so to remain in compliance with Republican political principles, um, at least in appearance, but that he was uh, the only one who, despite uh, often being formally a privatus, uh, still managed to become a rector senatus and effectively control the Republic. That is, Pompeius was successful even without a magistracy. This is what it made it challenging to emulate Pompeius's success. But even if there are doubts, of course, as to whether Lucan indeed implies all this, Vic must be correct, I think, that the poet does not use the term uh, privatus necessarily for those um, who did not have any public office or, uh, office or actual political power. Finally, um, Martin Helsley invites us to look a little bit further in this direction. Helsley's idea is that the term privatus serves as an antonym for Milis, a soldier, and that Lucan characterizes Caesar as being unable to act uh, as a privatus and always behaving as a dux, a military commander. Um, well, uh, Helsley does not consider the possibility that Lucan, uh, rather than using um, a, a privatus as part of a later sequence privatus on the one hand and princeps imperator maybe dux on the other hand that lucan maybe is more focused and maybe he's even using uh, just the republican dichotomy privatus magistratus and we know that for instance uh in Cicero's usage dux and privatus are perfectly combinable um a dux could act privato concilio famously in philippics we encounter this usage and could be characterized as a privatus. But Herzlian uh, does not consider this, he is forced to assume that there is a contradiction in Lucan 
obwohl er vom PS, der Tux, der Senatspartei ist, offiziell das Imperium innehat, stellt er sich ihn oft als Privates dar. So, um, even though Pompeius is the Dux of the Centurial Party and holds Imperium officially, the poet often labels him as a Privatus. However, in fact, Dux is perfectly combinable with Privatus, and Privatus can surely be endowed with Imperium. Um, the lines in Book 2, whoever schemes to raise Pompey above the Roman state covets too much for a mere subject of Privatus. Uh, Helsley suggests to understand these lines in the sense that the one who wants to uh, surpass Pompeius politically would have to act as a soldier despite that armed soldiers were not allowed um, in the city of Rome, Ramana in Urbe. This interpretation is based on the assumption that Lucan consistently uses Privatus to, as an antonym for Melis, which I think is a problematic assumption. Um, however, uh, Helsley's interpretation can be reformulated. Note the phrase Ramana in Urba. Often, by the way, conjectured to Romano in, Or in Orbe. If we retain in Urbe instead of in Orbe, uh, the passage can be understood as implying something more precise than Helsley suggests. If one wanted to surpass Pompeius in the city, these are rather cryptic lines, in fact. Why in the city? Why suddenly in the city? That is in the sphere domain, the political center of the Republic, in domestic politics, in the Senate, in the Committee, in, in, in uh, civil cantonists, rather than in provincial com commands somewhere outside the city, somewhere uh, uh, which, in some places which concerned imperial administration, militias, for example. Then, in this case, one could not act as a privatus, only Pompeius could. Uh, this, I think, responds uh, perfectly to the idea behind the lines in Book 3, where Lucan depicts how the proconsul Caesar, the, the Privatus, attempts to do what Pompeius was able to do. Uh, Caesar tries to convene the Senate, but as a result, he just illegally convinced the Senate. Pro magistrates were not allowed to do this. Uh, that is, as long as Caesar remains a proconsul, hence uh, a Privatus, he cannot surpass Pompeius in a legitimate way. In a republican way, in the area of civil administration in Rome, he cannot uh, become a new recognized civil rector senatus. Pompeius's claim in this logic could be something like that he was the only one who, despite the most of the time privatus still, as a proconsul, managed to attain the legitimate, the recognized uh, position of the rector senatus. That's essentially both Caesar and Pompeius were proconsuls, and they bo both were therefore privati. But only Pompeius was able to control the affairs in Rome in this capacity without having to act like a loose cannon, uh, Caesar did. So Hetze is essentially correct, I think, in appreciating the tension. And this is the last passage before I, um, um, uh, before the end of this talk. Um, so that he, Hetze must be essentially correct in, in appreciating the tension in Lucan's text between the status of privatus and the political dominance in the city. Uh, but the problem, I think, could not consist simply in that Caesar as a milis, as a military commander, was not allowed to act in the city. So as in, in this passage um, uh, to the left, in Hedges' book. Um, rather, I think he just lacked magisterial status, needed to surpass Pompeius in this fear domi in a proper legitimate way. So one way for Caesar was to become a magistrate, and he did it eventually do this. But before that moment, he attempted to become a new leader in the state uh, while still a privatus, while still a proconsul. But as a result, he was breaching all the rules. So what Lucan does, especially in book three, where he describes Caesar's convocation of the Senate, is that he essentially deconstructs Caesar's attempts to show his respect towards the formal limitations imposed on his power as a proconsul. Because, of course, the proconsul Caesar seized the political initiative in the city. He controlled everything. He was indeed all. But he still st st uh, stayed outside the city boundary. He still asked the tribunes to convene the Senate for him. We know that from other sources. So what Lucan does is that he exposed uh, that all these are just clumsy attempts uh, 
uh, on the part of Caesar to cover his illegitimate actions. So Lucan only exposed uh, this by making the formalities correspond better to reality. As a result, Lucan Caesar, already in his capa capacity as a proconsul, even before he became a magistrate, as a proconsul and imperium holder who was formerly a privatus, already did surpass his fellow proconsul Pompeius in Urbe, just as he would Militiae. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Roman. Um, wonderfully rich paper. Um, I'm sure there'll be plenty of questions and comments. There's a great deal to talk about. And as ever, it's probably more practical to use the chat function, if at all possible, to register your interest in, uh, in asking a question. Thank you. Well, I suppose a, a nut subtitle of your of your paper could have been Errores Philologorum. You, you have shown that a number of readings of Lucan have at least cut some corners. And, and you have shown that there's a decent case for thinking that the use of privatus is uh, on Lucan's part is accurate. Would you prepare to consider the possibility that whilst being accurate, uh, those uses of privatus are also tendentious. And that in other words, they are there to bring out a tension between the public and the private domain uh, in the motives, in, in, the, in the aims and agendas of the characters of Lucan's epic. Uh, well, yes, I think uh, they still needed a good reason, uh, additional reason to, to, to remember that these sectors were privati. Uh, well, consider they're acting in provinces. Nobody, uh, the, the difference for the provincials and the difference even for uh, for the Senate, for example, was not particularly high uh, between these uh, two different types of political actors. So you still needed something like uh, breaching the rules, something like uh, acting uh, in the city, acting instead of magistrates or something else to call these people Yes, I think that uh, the legal uh, uh, correctness, uh, technical, uh, uh, the, the fact that this uh, term, I think, is technically correct, somehow still is combinable with the fact that at the same time, the term is politically motivated, but not in the way which, uh, uh, which, which uh, usually, or at least often, has been mentioned in the scholarship. So yes, I would agree with this. This, this is certainly, it has something to do not just with legal definitions, but it was convenient for the political opponents of these people to remember and to use this legal definition. Thank you very much. We have a steady stream of questions already. Uh, Henrietta, please. Thank you very much, Roman, for your paper. I would say it's a typically Roman uh, Frolov paper, but in a very nice way, because you highlight a lot of interesting things, I think, about Lucan's text, and of course, also about uh, what happened in 49. I just have a very small question. So where Lucan, I think you said book nine, um, when Lucan uh, describes uh, Pompey as being uh, alone when the people were willing to be his slaves remained in Privatus. Um, I was just thinking when he says solos here, whether Lucan is also playing on the public persona that Pompey seems to have um, generated or at least exuded throughout his career as someone who was always a little bit unique, a little bit, you know, of a higher station, different in a good way from others, you know. Um, you know, the way Pompey often seemed to say, oh, I've done, already done so much for the Res Publica. Um, could other people please do this? And of course they can't because they're not as good as me. So, okay, I'll just do it anyway. That kind of image that we see, I think, in, in Plutarch and Dio. Do you think Lucan might be playing on that here also in his uh, description of Pompey as solos? Or is this completely overreading it? No, in fact, I would agree with this because Solo certainly indicates that this uh, situation is unique because both actors are very similar. They're both uh, similar in many ways, 
but then suddenly one is different and one is different i think precisely in that uh he was unique in how he uh communicated with the senate and all this uh thing so i think solace is important here well yeah somehow so that maybe that's just 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 a way for looking to underline uh a, a, another thing which makes pompeius at the same time the same as caesar but also different in a sub more subtle way so i think this is important thank you Christina. Hi, hi, Roman. Thanks um, for your paper. Sorry about the lack of camera, but it doesn't uh, seem to be properly working right now. Um, I was wondering up to what point this use of privatus, uh, but by non-Republican sources, is uh, somehow tainted by Octavian being a privatus in 44 and 43, um, which obviously couldn't be characterized as bad because he's Augustus, or later sources, of course, for later sources, he's Augustus. And how sometimes, how, if, if you think that somehow ha, that has imprinted the later uses of privatus. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you very much again. Um, Really good question. Um, well, uh, I think that that Lucan at least uh, bases his usage of what was uh, normal usage of the Republican time. Uh, which Republican time? So, um, well, again, the question is, why did they suddenly remember that uh, pro magistrates were private? Why did they use this in political? Uh, struggles, for example, when Caesar says that new kinds of imperia were uh, uh, devised, uh, which allowed Pompeius to stay uh, at Urbem and at the same time to administrate the far provinces in Spain, for example. Um, so I think that in this main uh, line of reasoning, Lucan is just following what at least partly had been the case before Octavian. Well, Octavian, um, do you mean do, 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 do you mean the way in which uh, the privato status of Octavian uh, was recognized by Octavian himself and was positively assessed somehow? Do you mean this part? Um, because uh, if no, I just, I just meant the fact that he was a privatus because he had no magistracy, mm -hmm. no imperium, no nothing. And it's something that you have mentioned that privat concilia, which is in the first lines of his uh, res gestae. So he's using that term. And we know that Caesar and his politics also uses that term to describe positively uh, Octavian and Octavian um, actions, actually. That's what I meant. Uh, even though, of course, concilium can have many, uh, many meanings, but is that what privato that really, you know, struck me? You made also reference to it. So well, yes. Uh, if if uh, if Octavian represents this acting privato concilio as a privatus being politically active to save the republic and so on, if this is represented by Octavian Augustus as something positive, then uh, could can what Lucan does be a reaction to this, right? A response to this uh, kind of ideology of privatus as Behan just suggested. Um, well, maybe, maybe this as well. Um, I don't know, I, I, I don't know, I, I do not know how to demonstrate or, 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 or to show that this does not hold, but I will need to think about this as well, right? The uh, connection between Octavian's representation of his status as a privatus and Lucan's using of this term. Thank you. I will need to look more into this direction as well. Thank you. Sure, thank you. Seems to me that David Rafferty's question is taking us into a comparable direction. David, would you like to elaborate on it yourself? Um, thanks very much. And thanks for a really interesting paper there, Roman. Um, I do want to ask, um, because there seems to be a lot of echoing in the Lucan you're talking about of uh, other excellent texts, like I'm thinking of the um, Caesar Will Be All, um, yeah. sort of echoes the uh, the mention in the Cicero's letter where he's talking about um, Curio's visit to him, that you know, everything will come from Caesar 
in, in these periods. But I particularly want to talk about the um, Caesar's Bellum Kilby generally. Um, and he Caesar makes a lot of headway or a, a lot of uh, mileage in that um, work from his enemies being Privati. Like it's, it's really only himself and Pompeius in the work who are referred to as Imperators. Um, and I just wonder if, if, if all pro magistrates are technically Privati, doesn't that kind of drain the force of a lot of what Caesar's trying to do there? Well, uh, do you mean that uh, the idea that um, he has uh, the right to uh, interfere in the political decision making because he is a um, successful, he's successful as a primagistan and therefore he can, he have he has this right? Do, do you mean something like this or just um, don't get the question? No, sorry, um, no, that's right. It's it's more I think that um, particularly in that. What for me was the really key passage um, at sort of one point six, where he's talking about you know, this privati mm -hmm. in the in the, in the capital and so ah. um, that it, he, he sort of you know I think the the conventional argument there is that he regards those uh, appointed under the Lex Pompeia, you know the guys who were privati when they were appointed as being in some way illegitimate or um, you know, that there's something about these particular pro magistrates that makes them privati. Um, and I'm just wondering if we are then to regard all pro magistrates as being privati, doesn't that sort of take away a lot of the force of his argument there and kind of put him on pretty shaky Okay, yeah, too. I get it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I think I get it. Uh, I actually have. Uh, there is a paper uh, of mine on on this uh, on this lines in on, on on Caesar, and <laughs> so at least I attempted it, 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 precisely. This is this is a really nice uh, reference because uh, I argue there that um, these people are called privati not because uh, they're uh, not because Caesar denies the validity of the law under which they're uh, appointed. Um, so, um, but but maybe just just one argument in this. Uh, the thing is that um, they are using their um, these people, these privati. Uh, the problem for Caesar was that they were using their power, at least their symbols of their power, within the city. So that this has uh, it doesn't matter under which law they're they're uh, appointed, and these privati I think are different from the people who were sent to the provinces under Pompeian law. These are different pro magistrates. But there is a I, I will I will send you a link, okay, uh, on this paper, and then I try to argue away uh, so the interpretation so to to, to deny <laughs> to to undermine to challenge at least uh, the interpretation that not all pro magistrates are privati, but in this particular case, some are privated because Caesar thought that something was wrong with precisely these people. And this is for this reason that he could call them privated. But I think this again uh, corresponds to, to the, my general impression, but this this is another point. I, I will I will send uh, a link maybe to this paper. Okay. <laughs> Thanks very much. If it's okay. Please do, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, other questions? Um, well, if no one else has anything else, I'll, I'll just quickly add one more thing. I, I really like the point about um, about uh, the sort of position of, and so, okay, generally the salience of pro magistrates being near Rome and sort of interfering in politics at some point we, you know, at, at just this period, like in the 50s. I, I think that's a really important point. Um, and more generally, the position of pro magistrates when they're not in their provinces, um, I think. And I thought the, um, the there's a passage in the Lex de Bruinquis Pretorius, um, which makes just that point really strongly. And I thought that that could back that up really, really well. Yes, the, the, <laughs> this is precisely what, uh, yeah, um, I read that part of the book. Uh, so, uh, and wanted to respond to it actually. Yes, yes, I think, uh, well, um, uh, just, just a short comment on this. Uh, so this law seems to indicate what kind of civil authority pro magistrates uh, could retain. And what the law does is that it actually enumerates almost all the powers, uh, which we usually consider the powers domi. And so one impression could be that 
Um, therefore, at least under certain circumstances, pro magistrates could be endowed with the powers dummy. Uh, but I think that an important word there is this, um, uh, what was the Greek equivalent for mandata. And uh, so I think that um, uh, the civil powers which were enumerated there, they all concerned uh, not the time um, after these expert magistrates leave the province and go back to Rome, but the time while they still were in their original province for which they received this mandate, because there is the, the line and um, syntagma or something like that. Um, uh, and all these powers are uh, um, uh, limited only to this earlier mandata which they had received apparently as pro, uh, as pro magistrates. So apparently something which had to do with the Praminga. I, had, I haven't look, uh, looked in, in, into the uh, details of which, but I think this is the impression. And therefore, um, so I do not think that this law can uh, prove uh, that uh, civil powers, so to speak, civil powers of pro magistrates was not a problem, was a part of usual administration. Of course, in the provinces, yes, but not uh, when, when you go <laughs> closer to Rome in some sense. So if we understand the sphere domi as something which uh, um, uh, uh, entailed only what was going on near Rome, then I think this is not what this law is talking about. But of course, on the other hand, civil powers in our sense, again, uh, in the province as well, all are, except for, by the way, convening the Senate and the people of Rome, because this is only in Rome. But other powers are perfectly possible, but they are all enumerated and listed one by one. And maybe this is the only reason for which we have at least this description of magisterial cap capability, because magistrate is someone who is not particularly limited in any way, potentially. And here we have this uh, lines, and th this is done, I think this must be done precisely because the magistrates were considered as, a, um, as actors whose capacity should be outlined, limited, and so on. Um, well, um, but I have to look uh, into this a little bit more. This is, uh, well, for my, for my reading, this is, a, this is a difficult part of the evidence. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, other questions or remarks? Roman, I wonder whether you could even briefly expand on uh, what you make of Elaine Fanton's reading of the Senate in, in Lucan. You, you briefly refer to it and you, you pointed to some areas of disagreement. Um, but more generally, I suppose, I'm interested in your overall assessment of uh, the, the quality of the value of, of Lucan's evidence for public law more broadly. Well, it's difficult to say because I only uh, looked into this particular detail and to, to, to which extent the, uh, the ideas in the scholarship can be explained and commented. I think, I, well, my impression is that uh, the, the way how Lucan distorts um, some details about the Senate um, on the one hand, and on the, on the other hand, his general, well, well, quite explicit interest in these technicalities, constitutional technicalities, for example, the problems which uh, the councils of 49 had at the end of, of the year 49. He's, for example, looking um, abstaining from using the term or any kind of uh, synonym for the Senate for the meeting of the centers after a certain point, I think after, after there were no magistrates anymore on the Republican side. So after 49, I think he doesn't call uh, this senator's meetings the Senate anymore. At the, on the other hand, in 49, for, for the material in 49, he does uh, provide many differences between, uh, describe many differences between the Senate's legal Senate, which is not the Senate at all, and the Republican Senate. Uh, and at, at the same time, he's, uh, well, very explicit, uh, uh, I think, 
discomfort about the fact that the Senate had to convene somewhere else and so on. So I think that you, you, my impression is that many, many other tales suggest that if Lucan was ready to um, think about magistrates and pro-magistrates, well, this could have been, could well have been the case. Um, I would not be um, surprised at all uh, judging uh, by other details. And this is precisely what also Elaine Fanta uh, did uh, in her work, work uh, on the Senate, uh, all the other issues. Um, well, uh, I think this corresponds, it's just another detail into this uh, general conclusion that Lucan is quite sophisticated in what concerns the uh, these technicalities. And even if he distorts something, he distorts something in such a way that allows us to appreciate uh, his awareness of all these details, constitutional details as well. His interest in these details and he's using this Republican uh, terminology and everything. Well, but again, I have to say that Lucan is something completely a new material for me. I may be wrong in many points, uh, but uh, judging on what he says about pro magistrates, well, he's astonishingly uh, sophisticated in this respect. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Are there other um, comments, remarks, suggestions? Laudations? Well, in which case, I, I think we, we, we really should thank Roman very warmly indeed for uh, this wonderfully rich and, and truly stimulating paper. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Roman, uh, for sharing these. Thank you so much. Um, thoughts. Um, with us. Um, we are reconvening next week, uh, Thursday, 4 p.m. UK time. Uh, the speaker would be Cristina, uh, I believe. Oh, right? yep. Cristina Rosillo Lopez. Um, till then, um, have a lovely weekend when it comes and a lovely week, more broadly. <laughs> Goodbye, everyone, and thanks very much, Roman.